to threaten them. So that I'll cut off your limbs from opposite sides and I'll crucify you. You say, you can do whatever you want. Do whatever you want. The only thing you can do is this world. So we see immediately, as soon as the perspective changes, that there is another reality, a true reality that's in a different world, the priorities shift. What they're able to do shifts. What they're willing to sacrifice shifts. So that's what, something that we have to look at within ourselves. Now the difficulty that it comes to with doing the islah and fixing of the self is that we're very good at tricking ourselves. We're very good at deceiving ourselves into thinking positively about ourselves in a way that you know, is maybe not very accurate. There's even sort of studies about this that show that, uh, I mean, I, I don't give too much weight to psychological studies and things, like that, but uh, I'll just mention. There's a study that shows that they gave the questionnaires to people, uh, basically sort of giving them certain questions. I'm not exactly sure what type of questions are, but some sort of things to gauge their intelligence. And then at the end, they're also asked to gauge how well they think they did on it. And it seemed like, consistently, the people who did the worst would always think that they would do the best. The ones who would do the worst on the test, the ones who would be you know, feeling it, would always think that they did really good. So we have this faculty within ourselves that we tend to very much easily ignore our faults, ignore our deficiencies. And if you've tried the introspection to think about yourself, to think heavy thoughts, you'll find this. That your mind starts going on there, and as soon as it starts, it sort of diverges. It's not, it doesn't rest easy. The heavy thoughts are difficult to wake up, difficult to gauge ourselves based on. So it's something that we have to do, but it's difficult. Now along those lines, I want to mention a couple of things. If you look at the aspects and dimensions of a human you can, in one manner, split them into three sort of faculties, or three dimensions. And there, there's various ways of doing this. I'm not talking in a particularly philosophical manner uh, or a very precise manner in the splitting. And so it might not be extremely accurate from that lens, but it's useful in a way to analyze ourselves. At the base root of ourselves and what forms our being is our belief system. What we believe to be true, what we believe to be false. That creates the bedrock of everything that comes out. And the other extreme is our actions. What we actually end up doing. Whether internal actions or external. Internal actions like thinking, pondering, deciding. Those are actions as well. But external actions too. Whether we pray or not, whether we sleep, eat, everything that we do. But there's something in the middle as well. This middle thing is something that I want to focus on for a little bit. And this middle thing is our motivations. What pushes us to go one way or another. Now these motivations are not always entirely in line with our beliefs, nor are they always entirely in line with our actions. We have the ability to overcome our motivations, right? the inclinations that are, exist within us. We're doing that right now, in fact. Probably all of us are a bit hungry, a bit thirsty. But we're overcoming that inclination to eat and drink because of a higher thing, a higher motivation. I think that, okay, fasting is something that most people want to me. There's a higher purpose. I'll overcome those lower things for this higher purpose. And so there's this conflict between these two motivations, and a higher motivation wins out. This is perhaps a more useful way, or a more practical way, to analyze ourselves and to see where we are. Because if you go based on the belief system, it's very easy to just say, I'm a Muslim, pat myself on the back and say as if like, everything is okay. I'm a Shia, I have all these things, I cry for Imam Hussain, I'm in the Majlis, I do all these things. If you look at the action, same thing. We can very easily deceive ourselves by looking at specific actions that we do. Okay, I did pray, I did fast, I did this thing, I did that thing. Without looking at the whole picture. But when you look at the motivations, we're very much in touch with them. So we feel when we're pulled in two different directions. 
We feel when there's one thing leading us in one way and another thing leading us in another way. And so when those times happen, it's an immediate time where we can look and start to think about ourselves. What is it that wins out? What motivation is the one that wins out? Is it the one that's connected with Allah SWT? Or is it the one that's connected to my desires or to peer pressure or to societal pressure or whatever it is? Now, if we look at this, we see that the whole idea of Islam is to train ourselves so that over time, the motivations that we have become purely and purely in line with God's will. But Allah SWT wants from us. The only way that that happens though, is by focusing on our beliefs. Everything springs from our beliefs. Nothing is separate. As an example, if I know that there is a fire, right, the stove is hot for example, I know that the stove is very hot, and I know if I touch it I'll get burnt, then unless I have some sort of sickness, I'm not going to go and touch the stove. Because I have this desire to stay healthy, to, stay, you know, to not be injured, to not be burnt, so I'll never touch the stove. It's very, very clear to me. But why am I not going to do it? Right? Even if there's, let's say there's a very, very delicious looking food there, I'm not going to touch it without some sort of protection. It's not even like a question for me. It's not even like the slightest thing. Why is it so easy for me to overcome my hunger? It's because I know for sure I'm going to get burnt. And I know for sure I don't want that. But if you look at the parallel of that in religion, that I know for sure there's a hellfire. I know for sure that Allah SWT has promised that if I do sin and I don't ask for forgiveness, then I'm going to go there. Then why is it that I don't stop sinning? It's because sometimes we look at the next world as something so far away so abstract, so, you know, almost unimportant, it's easy for us to ignore. So we have to concentrate on our beliefs. But the question is how? Like, how do we fix our beliefs? It's easier said than done. Words are easy. Things, anyone can say words. Anyone can just say, I need to be a better Muslim. I need to believe in God. I need to do this, right? But it doesn't change anything. Idiom in Farsi. I can say halwa all I want, but my mouth won't become sweet just by saying home. It doesn't change it. The words are easy. It doesn't change reality just by saying something. But Alhamdulillah, Allah SWT is looking after us. Every single thing that Allah SWT wants us to do from the wajibat and avoiding the muharramat are all geared specifically for us to improve in our belief system. Every single thing. We have an idea in our minds that we have to first have perfect belief and then we'll act. I first have to believe completely that God exists, that the, there's a heaven, there's a hell and all these things and then I'll act. The Son of God says if that was the case, then we would never train our children to pray. Because, you know, we see when children are children, they don't understand what they're praying to, they don't understand what they're doing, they don't understand any of that. But you encourage them to do it, despite not knowing. Knowing that they don't know what they're doing, why they're doing it, who they're in front of. They don't understand the importance of it. But it's important that they do it. Why? Because these certain patterns of action influence us, soften our hearts to be able to change and understand reality. As an example, if you've ever seen someone who, you know, never has any friends, there's very few people, it's maybe you know someone, doesn't have any friends at all, right? never hangs out with anyone, never has any meaningful bonds, no meaningful relationships, nothing with them. 
They live their life constantly as an individual, separated from all forms of society. That person, no matter how much you tell them that if you, you know, become friends with someone, you have, let's say, a marriage, you have some sort of meaningful relationship, parents, children, something, but there's a lot that you can gain from it. There's beautiful things. You'll have a pleasure in that relationship that you can never gain as an individual. No matter how much you tell them that, they won't accept it. They won't understand what you're saying. But if as a child that they experienced it, even in a limited way, if they ex experienced the comfort of parents, if they experienced you know, the comfort of siblings, of friends, even as a young age, when they don't even understand concepts that we're talking about in this matter, later on, even if they're secluded, then our hearts will yearn for having friends. something that they experienced. Our salat, our acts of obedience are something like this as well. When we're doing our wajibat and avoiding the haram, we're training ourselves to open our hearts to reality. We might not know the exact link between things. We might not understand why does God want me to fast from dawn till dusk. That might not make sense to me. It might be completely nonsense to me. I could say, well, you know, if I wanted to worship God more, let me have some drink, let me drink something, let me have some energy, then I can worship Him more. This seems to make sense, right? It's not the point. Their links might not understand, I might not understand, but it re exists for a reason. I'll give an example from the Quran. There's a very beautiful um, story in the Qur'an regarding Talut and Jalut that we know, probably most of us are familiar with the story, so I won't go into detail about the actual story. I'll just quote the verse. It's in Surah Baqarah, verse number 249. It says, 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 It when Jalu, sorry, when Paulu and his army is going out to sort of go towards fighting Jalu and having that sort of whole war and battle, he tells them that certainly Allah is going to test you with a river. And it says, From an minhu Whoever drinks from this river is not from among you. I mean, they're, have to, they're going to be kicked out of the army. And the one who doesn't take from that river, doesn't drink from it, they're going to be from among you. Except for, you know, if someone takes one handful of water, that's okay. Now again, you might think, why would a Muslim want to test people like this? He's already testing them to go fight. Now he's telling this tired army that's walking in the hot, probably weather, that okay, you're coming across a river, don't drink from it. It doesn't make sense. Like from our intellect's perspective, it doesn't make sense. Even if he does test them, why is he keeping them out of the army? Right? At the end of the day, they're going to fight. Right? Why don't at least keep them? There's you know, power in numbers. He keeps them out. Continues. Fasharu minhu illa qalila minhu. Says that. They drink from them, except for a few from them. Very few. <coughs> so most of the people are kicked out of the army. فَلَمَّا جَاوَزُهُ هُوَ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَعَهُمْ قَالُوا لَا طَاقَةَ لَنَا الْيَوْمِ بِجَالُوتَ وَجِنُونَ So that when this whole event passes, this now there's very few numbers left. Some people start saying that, look, we don't have any strength with this. How are we going to defeat Jalut and all of his army? They so much more numbers than us, so much more powerful than us. How are we going to win? What's the response? It says, <laughs> It says, that it's important. 
describes the people in a particular way. The ones who know they're going to meet their Lord. These people respond. The ones who know they're going to meet their Lord. They say, how many a small party has overcome a large party by the permission of Allah? And then we know what happens. Then Hazrat Dawood comes and he has strikes and wins over Jalu and he disperses their army with one, you know, slingshot. It's just that simple. The numbers have nothing to do with it. The apparent thing that we judge victory based on, what's more likely to win an army? Who has the better numbers? Who has the better equipment? Who has the better armor? Who is more rested? Who has drink water? Who has food? That's how we look at it. That's not the criteria that we mentioned here. I'm not saying those things aren't important. No, you should use them. You definitely need them. But they're not the determining factor. The determining factor is God's will. How did those people make that determination that they could win? It's because they were certain they were going to meet their Lord. Another verse that we recited today in this chosen the whole event of Prophet Musa and all of the people of Bani Israel are leaving, running away from Fir'aun. Right? Fir'aun and his armies are coming after them. They come to the shore. Right? The person says, like, What are we going to do? Right? The, these two groups are going to meet. There's no way to escape. What does Hazrat Musa say? He says, that certainly my Lord is with me, he will guide me. <coughs> this idea that what would determine my next step, the future, is not in my hands, not in the things that I see around me. It's in God's will purely and only. If we encapsulate that idea, then we're able to move beyond these material bonds that we're in. I don't have too much time, but I want to mention one more verse. I'll just paraphrase it and I'll mention just a part of the verse that I guess is more striking. We'll talk more about it tomorrow. There's a verse in the Quran in Surah Araf uh, where it describes the mission of the Prophet, what he comes, what he's coming to do and accomplish. In the middle of it, near to the end, it says this. It says, وَيَضَعَ عَنْهُمْ إِسْرَهُمْ وَلَغْلَانَ الَّذِي كَانَتْ عَلَيْهِ He has come to relieve you of your chains, of the burdens and the chains that are holding you. He's coming to relieve you of that. Free you from it. At first glance, it might mean that, okay, that means that I should be able to do whatever I want. He's coming to free me. So I should be able to be free, do whatever I want. But in the same verse, right before it, it talked about how he made halal the tayyibat and made haram the khabat. Okay. Already said that there's halal and haram. He's already constricting my actions. Okay, so by a second glance, I'm saying, despite him saying that, he's free. But if we look at it more properly, it's not despite. It's through the halal and making a haram the khabar that he's free. So the question is freeing me from what? Freeing me from the false imprisonment of thinking that this world is all that there is. That what matters in this world are the celebrities, the actors, the famous people, this thing, that thing, the trappings of this world, the glitter and the glory, the wealth. These are the things. No, those don't matter. There's something more important. Free me from that. Because if I live my life like that, I'm living a delusion. That's what he's free me from. If you want that to be the last minute, there's one last thing that fits with this one. There's another part, not in the Quran, in the first khutbah of Najm al Nazm. There's another place where in the first khutbah, where the Imam Ayyasam talks about the mission of the Prophet. One of the things that he says is that the Prophet came for 
Says Yathiru nuhum the fa'in al aqul that he came he came to unbury or to uncover the buried treasures of the intellect. This is the buried treasure of the intellect. Becoming aware that this world is not all that matters. As a verse that I quoted at the beginning, this verse, this world, it's lahu wa lahu, it's plain diversion. The next world, that's Dar al Haywan. That's where I can live, breathe freely for the first time. Shall we can continue on this topic tomorrow? Mention a few lines of it. See you in the Continue with that as a line. Salaamu alayka ya Amir al Mu'mineen ya Ali al Nabi Qalim ya Wasiy al Rasulillah ya Hujjat Allah ala qalbi. Your brothers and sisters, sometimes when we talk about the Wasiy of the Mu'mineen. We talk about him being struck on the head, as we did last night. But the Musiba of Amir al Mu'mineen does not start there. The Musiba of Amir al Mu'mineen starts at the time of the death of the Prophet. At the time when he was taken from his house by force, and Hazrat Fatul Zahra goes door to door with the Ansar and the Mahajir asking them, were you not in Ghadir? Did you not hear what my father said about Ali? Why aren't you supporting him? Where are you? The Musiba of Amir al starts in a dark burial at night time where there's no Mahna Mahram there. Where it's only him to marry his wife, who is in Fatima to Zahra. He addresses the Prophet, saying, I've got the I've returned you my trust, the trust that you've given to me. But don't ask me in which state it's been returned. If there's broken ribs, don't ask me how that happened. What does the real woman say? My grief is never ending. Well, my lady, my nights will never come today. That's the pain that the mere woman feels in separation with the heart. But who is seeing this? Hassanain are seeing this. Local phones. Zainab is seeing this. Zainab is seeing the pain of her father from that young age. She's seeing that the people of Medina no longer respond to the Salam of Ali. That it was only when Hazrat Prophet was alive that they gave him some respect. But when she passes, even that is gone. Zainab is seeing this as a little child, but as a daughter who cares for her father. She goes, she helps him, she supports him. But what happens in Kufa? What happens in Kufa when she sees that her father has returned struck on his head? Yes, of course she's saddened, but perhaps she hears the echoes of Fustu or Abdul Kaaba. She thinks to herself that finally her father will be at peace. Finally my father is going to return to Zahra. But look at it from the perspective of Zayn. What can we give to the support, to give comfort to Zayna? Aman is the Zayna. This is just the beginning of her suffering. She doesn't understand. She sees the death of her father. She sees the treachery of Imam Hassan and Islam to fix him. She sees what happens in Karbala. Until it comes to a point where she's on to the Zayna Biya. When she brought child is on Allah Sadri.
Yeah. 
وسيلة وأمير المؤمنين والصلوات على محمد وعلى محمد.
Brothers and sisters, just a small request in the spirit of conservation. Please keep your plates from the top so that the child can reach them during dinner as well. That's what we're not wasting their wasting supplies out there.